There are two main audiences that come to Jumu'ah. Those who say, brother, please avoid any controversial topics. We just want a nice reminder for the week. And then there are those who say, brother, when I come to Jumu'ah, I don't want to hear a bedtime story. We live in the real world with real challenges, with real controversies. So when the khatib sticks to safe topics, it becomes repetitive and uninformative. I'd much rather you talk about something that will actually benefit us. So as you may have guessed, I tend to agree with the latter. There is a particular hadith which non-Muslims use to attack Islam. And if we don't address it, then I feel that I will have failed to equip you with the tools necessary to defend your deen, to defend your faith. And personally, I find this unacceptable. And so, let's get right into it. The Prophet ﷺ says, this is an authentic hadith in Sahih Bukhari. أُرِيتُ النَّارِ فَإِذَا أَكْثَرُ أَهْلِهَا النِّسَاءِ يَكْفُرْنَ قِيلَ أَيَكْفُرْنَ بِاللَّهِ قَالَ يَكْفُرْنَ الْأَعْشِيرِ وَيَكْفُرْنَ الْإِحْسَانِ لَوْ أَحْسَنْتَ إِلَى إِحْدَاهُنَّ الدَّهْرِ ثُمَّ رَأَتْ مِنْكَ شَيْئًا قَالَتْ مَا رَأَيْتُ مِنْكَ خَيْرًا قط. That the Prophet says, I was shown the hellfire and that the majority of its dwellers were women who were ungrateful women who were ungrateful and so he was asked were they ungrateful to Allah and he replied they were ungrateful to their husbands and are ungrateful for the favors and the good that was done to them if you have always treated them very well and then she sees one thing she just sees something small that is negative within you she will say I have never received any good from you this is the hadith I'm sure you can all understand this is a very contentious question how do we explain this? Well, there are a number of ways that people try to go about dealing with this hadith. The non-Muslim, of course, would say, well, clearly this is an indication that Islam is misogynistic. End of conversation. The modernist Muslim would say what? Well, it doesn't really mean what it says. It says one thing, but it means something else. And they just basically ignore the meaning of the hadith, pretend it's not there, which I think is an unacceptable sort of liberal mod mod modern type of way of dealing with our hadith. We don't just take them and brush them under the rug. But then there's a hardline approach, which I think is kind of rough. Some men would just say, yep, women are inherently worse. They're just ungrateful. That's it. That's the end of conversation. I don't think that that is true either. What are they, inherently just more evil? I don't think that's the case either. So how can we explain this in a way that perhaps we can navigate this and, and actually develop some beneficial lessons from this hadith? I propose a different approach. One of the greatest differences between men and women when you look at it from a psychological perspective, is their interests in occupation. So let's, let's build the premise up first. Number one, you have to, to understand, you have to understand that men and women are different in terms of their interests in occupation. What do I mean by this? There have been many, many studies, you can go online and look this stuff up for yourself to confirm that there have been many studies that have reached the same conclusion that men are interested in things and women, women are interested in people. At young ages, you'll find that, uh, uh, these are generalities, it's not 100% of the time, but in general, you'll find young boys play with cars and trucks, girls play with dolls. But as you get older, you'll find that when people get married, the man will generally work outside of the home to contribute to the family, whereas the woman will work inside of the home, dealing with the kids to contribute to the family. Now, of course, there are women in the workforce as well, but even with regards to the women in the workforce, you find that men tend to work jobs that indirectly benefit human beings, such as the STEM fields, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, programming, construction work, etc., etc. These things benefit people indirectly, whereas women tend to lean towards jobs that benefit people directly. So for instance, you'll find that women are dominating fields like teachers, nurses, doctors, therapists, the type of jobs where you deal with an individual directly. Now, let me be clear about something. I am not saying that women are incapable of doing a male-dominated job or field. I'm not saying that they are incapable of doing that, nor am I saying that men are incapable of doing the female-dominated jobs. Both are capable. It's a question of interests. When you have free will, what do you choose? It's not a question of, can I do it? It's a question of, what do I want to do? So I hope that difference is uh, clear, inshallah ta'ala. Now, of course, the question may come about, why is this the case? Allah knows best, but it seems that Allah ta'ala designed men and, different, men and women differently. It seems that, obviously, since women are the ones that get pregnant, it makes sense 
that they are the ones that are more interested in people because in order to produce a human, in order to carry this small human for nine months and cater to this baby every time it cries, every time it screams, every time it, every time it needs food, every time it needs to be changed or wants to be held, you have to really care a lot about people. You have to be very interested in people to be patient with such an inconsiderate baby. Babies don't care if you're tired. Babies don't care if you're sick. Baby don't, babies don't care how busy you are, how stressed you are. Babies just scream and they need attention. So in order to be able to cater to this, let's say, uncompromising child, you have to really like people. So SubhanAllah, Allah Ta'ala designed women to like and to be interested in people so much more and men more interested in things. This seems to be the case. Now, if you can believe all the science and all the statistics that prove this fact, if we can accept this basic premise that men are more interested in things and women are more interested in people, then it should not be a shock that of the two genders that both of them should be shown gratitude for their contribution to humanity, the group that directly benefits others will be shown more gratitude than the group that indirectly benefits others because indirect benefit often means that people forget about your contribution. In short, I know this is very technical language, but in short, men's work often goes unnoticed. So, so far, uh, I'm using very abstract language, but let me say it in more practical terms. First and foremost, let me be clear that I'm not objecting to the love and admiration mothers receive. Moms have the number one spot. We all know the hadith. With the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, who should I be best to? Your mother, number one. And then after that, still your mother. Number three, number three still your mother, and then your father. I'm not trying to uh, uh, compete with women in their top spot. Moms should give, be given you the most amount of love and admiration. I'm not contesting that at all. I'm simply saying that dads work hard too. And it's concerning when our kids don't seem to realize it. So allow me to give a practical example so I can use all this technical jargon and turn into something a little bit more uh, relatable. For instance, just a few days ago, I was in class and I teach our kids. It's not some other people's community. It's our community, our kids, okay? So I'm talking to our youth and these are the youth that are, you know, just about to graduate, inshallah, uh, you know, soon to be going to university. You know, they're becoming young adults. And I was discuss discussing uh, some issues about marriage because I'm trying to prepare them for the inevitability, inshallah, soon enough they're going to be considering marriage, inshallah. So we talk about these issues and then one young student, she said, well, it's easy to be a dad. Being a mom is much harder. Dads hardly do anything. And this is just one sister, but believe me, this, I, I, this attitude is prevalent. I'm not picking on her. This attitude is very prevalent amongst many people in our society. So she says that. And so I try to explain. I say, look, I understand that mom benefits you directly all the time. Mashallah, that's great. But is it possible that you're forgetting all of the indirect benefit that you get from dad? Is it possible? For instance, it's probably the case that mom woke you up this morning to get you to school, right? So you saw mom's face. First thing you wake up and you see mom's face. Direct benefit. Thanks, mom. So much gratitude. But then when you took a shower, did you think, man, it's so nice that dad paid for the hot water? Did you think about that? Probably not. When you put on your clothes, did you ask yourself who paid for this? No. So direct with mom, indirect with dad. Easy to overlook dad's contributions. Then you probably had a beautiful morning breakfast. Mom cooked up for you. Thanks, mom. Thank you so much for cooking. But do you remember who paid for the ingredients? Who paid for the actual food? Usually these things go overlooked. Then mom drove you to school. Thanks, mom. Mom is always there for me. If I'm late, she'll jump in the car, drive me to school. So direct benefit. Thank you so much, mom. But do you ever ask yourself, wait a second, who paid for the car, right? So it's very easy to overlook all of the contributions. So again, your mom works incredibly hard and deserves your absolute love and appreciation. I'm not contesting that at all. But let me ask you, I asked this young sister, do you even know what your dad does all day? You might know the title of his job, but what does he actually do at work? Can you explain his job? Do you know what type of deadlines he has? Do you know what type of pressure he has? What does he do all day? She was kind of like, you know what? I see your point. Alhamdulillah, there was no, no fighting, no contentious. It wasn't some sort of angry back and forth. She just said, you know what, that's a very good point. That I see my mom as contributing so much, which she does, which she does. Moms do incredible work. No one's taking anything away from that. But it's very easy to overlook all of dad's hard work and sacrifices. Most of us regularly sit around the table at dinner time and we enjoy a beautiful meal prepared by mom by our wife and everybody compliments the, de the delicious meal as we should because she worked hard on a beautiful meal we should be grateful but when was the last time can you ever remember a time where as a family everybody said you know what i also want to thank dad dad thanks so much for paying the electricity bill it would be pretty hard to eat this meal in the dark 
Anybody ever say that? Any hands? No? Exactly. Nobody. Nobody ever says that. Does anybody say, you know, it's really nice that we're sitting in this beautiful climate. You know, thank you, Dad, for making sure that the heating and the, and the AC works. Otherwise, we'd be too hot or too cold. Nobody thinks about that stuff. Nobody thinks about who paid for the chair or the table that we're sitting at. No, these, these factors go completely unnoticed. And to make things worse, our children are consuming social media, which is full of, unfortunately, young women who are telling other young, impressionable women, men are useless, the world would be better without men. Completely ignoring the fact that oftentimes the, this young woman who's recording this very hateful message is on her phone, which is connected to a cell phone tower, and sometimes they're sitting in their car, and that car is sitting on a paved road, surrounded by a bunch of buildings. Who built this whole city around you? Who paved the roads? Who built the car? Who made the cell phone towers? Who developed this whole concept of phones and so on and so forth? Was it all engineers, teams of women? Was it a bunch of construction workers, all teams of females? When was the last time you saw that? Again, no one is taking away from the incredible contributions, of course, that our women are constantly sacrificing so much. The women could say, hey, who birthed all those men? And we would say, yes, the women did, of course. But do you see the point that there is both? We, we have to be appreciative to our women, but at the same time, this attitude, this regular, consistent, especially online and social media, this attitude of men are useless. What are their contributions? SubhanAllah, open your eyes and look around you. So this is something that is very unfortunate when we see that this is the prevalent narrative. May Allah Ta'ala protect us from ingratitude. So yes, my question to our sisters, our wives, the, 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 the wives of the community, my question is very simple. Do you know how your daughter feels about marriage and motherhood? Do you know how your daughter feels about marriage and motherhood? Because the more I engage with our young sisters, I'm finding that their attitude is getting worse and worse and worse. And there's many contributing factors, but one clear factor is this issue of thinking and feeling like men are ultimately useless. So who cares if we have to get married or so forth? It doesn't seem to be important. Let me give you some in in interesting statistics to hopefully open your eyes to the trends that we are dealing with currently. In the United States and the UK, the trends seem to be consistent, that women are having children later and later. Back in 1941, the women, excuse me, the women that were born in 1941 in the UK, when they reached the age of 30, only 18% of them never had a child. That means the, well, that makes 82% uh, had children by the age of 30. That was the norm, the vast majority having children by the age of 30. Nowadays, it's been steadily declining to the point that now the women that were born in the 1990s that are now 30 years old, roughly, over, over half, over 50% of them have never had a kid. So the whole institution of, of marriage is steadily, steadily on the decline. Furthermore, in terms of marriage, we see that 40 to 50% of all marriages end in divorce. 40 to 50, imagine, next time you're at a wedding, how sad is this? 40 to 50% of the marriages end in divorce. And according to the 2015 research study conducted by the American Sociological Association, the ACA, uh, excuse me, ASA, nearly 70% of all divorces are initiated by women. So about half of marriages end in divorce. And of that half of all those marriages, about 70% of them are the women saying, I've had enough. So of course there's problems on both sides, men and women. But it seems that the guys are saying, I'm willing to work, keep working it out. I'm willing to stick it out. Women are like, no, thank you. I don't, see, I don't see you as useful. Do we see the trend here? And so I'm not trying to place all of the responsibility on women. Men have lots to improve upon as well. It is a team effort at the end of the day. The whole idea of us coming together as men and women, it's a team effort. It has to be men and women. Men and women have to come together to strengthen the Muslim household. Men need to lead and provide with love and tenderness and care. We need to work on ourselves as leaders to be not only the financial leaders, but also the spiritual leaders to make sure that we are practicing our deen and are uh, setting an example for the household. Absolutely. But women also need to be grateful, even for the indirect support that they get. And even when they are upset, you have to be able to remember all of the hard work and sacrifice that goes on behind the scenes. And inshallah, I'll conclude with some remarks in the second khutbah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala wa sahbihi wa sallam sallam kithira. Bismillah. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. We are living in times where it's trendy to discount male contribution, men's contributions. And I'm simply saying that a little bit of gratitude can go a very long way. Sisters, my question to you is this. What message are we teaching our kids through what we say, and perhaps even more importantly, through what we don't say? 
That's the main point. It's not just about what you say. It's also about what you're not saying. Sisters, I'm sure there are some of you that, you know, have a husband who's a terrible guy. I'm sure that happens. Unfortunately, it's a reality. Some guys are just not good. But I would definitely say that we live in a well-to-do community. And inshallah ta'ala, alhamdulillah, we have lots of practicing Muslims. And it would be fair to say that, yes, many of you are married to good men. And so if you have a good husband, if you know this applies to you, isn't it perhaps time that you sit your daughter down and say something as simple as this? Your father married me. I've had the privilege of having wonderful children and watching them grow up. He's worked hard to provide for us, keep us safe. And if things got dangerous, he would even gladly die for us. We live in a nice home in a safe neighborhood. I drive a nice car. And yes, dad is not perfect, but he's done a great job. And I pray my dear daughter that you can find a man that will love you and take care of you like your dad has done for us. Is this something that is too hard to say? I'm asking honestly, is this something too difficult? Because it seems, based on my interaction with our young sisters, it seems that this message is simply not coming through to the young girls. Their attitude is, who cares? Men are useless. What's the point of marriage? What's the point of childbearing? They don't see the beauty in it. I just have to wonder, is it all the men's fault? Or is it possible that sisters, you have to start letting them know, I'm really grateful. I know I can depend upon your dad. I know how hard he works. Maybe we don't say it enough. Maybe we, don't, we never see it. But he is constantly working hard, and you need to see that before you, you, know, you get to a certain age where you, you now regret all the missed opportunities. We know that Allah Ta'ala says what? لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Allah Ta'ala says, if you are grateful, then I will increase you. Now perhaps it's the case that gratitude for the hard work that usually goes unnoticed will set the example for our children. And it'll make them realize the power of cooperation and will result, inshallah ta'ala, in their marriages and in your grandkids. And so, yes, you are grateful and Allah will increase you. You show some gratitude to your husband, inshallah ta'ala, what happens? Inshallah, you get blessed with grandchildren. This is the hope. And so I hope we can understand that this hadith is not necessarily just some sort of misogynistic attack. Rather, it's a beautiful reminder that human beings are built differently. Men and women have tendencies to work on things that are either directly benefit humans or versus indirect benefit. And it's easy to overlook the indirect benefit. And it's our responsibility, both men and women, to always appreciate the people who contribute to us both directly and indirectly. And of course, the final, the final point that I want to say is this, that some non-Muslims, they complain. And they say, oh, Islam is only the fastest growing religion because of birth rates. Right? You see, you see they, they try to attack Islam and say, it's just because of birth rates that you guys are having a, a, a high, you know, Islam is a growing religion. But they say that like it's an insult, but it isn't an insult. The fact of the matter is, nowadays, maintaining heterosexuality, getting married, having children, raising them in Islam, avoiding divorce, all of this is a huge accomplishment. All of it is becoming more and more rare. So if Islam is growing because of great birth rates, my answer is, so be it. Alhamdulillah. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who can maintain the bonds of marriage. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who do not delay and delay and delay until it is too late. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who can raise up righteous families and children for future generations. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who are always grateful for the incredible contributions, the incredible sacrifice that our women make when they do have children, when they do maintain a household, when they do put in so much love and care. And may Allah Ta'ala make us also grateful to the fathers who work tirelessly and who so much of their work goes completely unnoticed because it's always behind the scenes. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen.